All right, we're on. This is the College of Complexes, and we have with us tonight Lowell Thompson, the author of African Americans in Chicago. And he will be speaking to us in a minute. Uh, but we are going to first our author. How's it sound? Pretty good? No yes, problem. just... just okay. Further? No, you're, you're good. Just speak okay. loudly into the mic. Speak loudly. Okay. I'm going to try to do this. Right. Uh, this is a very... Uh, I can see this is a very august... <laughs> contentious, contentiously august. <laughs> so, but I came up with a title for this. And uh, when I decided to do it, and I ran into uh, Charles Haydock, right? Yes. Yeah, I ran into him at the um, Critters Row Book Fair uh, about two months ago. And I had heard of this college complexes for, uh, for years, but I never thought that I would actually be able to be up in front of this group, this August group, contentious, contentious for August group. So, so far, it's good to be here. <laughs> so far. So far. Bending so over. <laughs> but I'm a glutton for punishment. So I'm going to start with the title of my talk. And, and I don't like to say I'm giving a talk or a speech because I try to hear as much from the audience as I give the audience. I have the hardest working audiences in show business. So I'm going to start with the title, which is the education of the Caucasian. That's with a shout out to Carter G. Woodson. And I'll, uh, that'll be one of my questions uh, when I get to that point. I want to ask people here, how many people here have ever been on the south side of Chicago? <laughs> oh, man, I'm shocked. I'm not even going to talk about the west side. I don't even go over to the west side. Even the west side? Oh, man. Yeah. I can see this is a, a, a very experienced group because I, I did a similar talk at the uh, Revolution Bookstore uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't get the kind of uh, hands raised that I'm getting from you guys. But, now that I think about it, Revolution Books, it's on, yeah, just south of Division on Ashland, like 1103, yeah, I think it's 1103 North Ashland. And it was a good, I mean, we had a good group and everything, but um, they didn't have the experience on the south side like you do. Mm -hmm. But, then I think about it, I said, wait a minute, <clears throat> I may be letting you off a little too easy. Because, depending upon when you were on the south side, it was not the south side that I grew up on. And a lot of people here are at least my age or maybe a little older. And depending upon what part of the south side you were on, that was the place that guys who looked like me did not go. I remember I grew up, I was born at 3625 Giles. Anybody know where Giles is? You're close. <laughs> He's close. <laughs> now nah, he's talking. 3625 Jobs is where I was born in 1947. And in that part of the South Side when I was born, you better not go a mile west. And what was a mile west? Bridgeport. Bridgeport, Mayor Daly's neighborhood. And you did not go, if you were of my complexion, and people call me black, but I think I'm more of a burnt umber. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, and I, <laughs> that's good. Well, maybe somewhere between this burnt sienna and burnt umber. I'm an artist. So, so you didn't go west of Wentworth, but you would toast. I mean, even, but in the 90s, remember the, uh, uh, was it Clark, his last name was Clark, Lance Clark or something that was beat up and badly beaten? Wasn't that 1998? Yeah, somewhere around there, and it, not much had changed, even though Daly was no longer there. Uh, the vestige of Daly was there. And there were other, lots of other parts of the South Side in 1947, 1950, when I was growing up, that you didn't go south of 63rd, you didn't go west of uh, Western, you didn't. So that if you were on the South Side, if you know anything about the history of this, of African Americans in this city, uh, you know that the South Side was not always the 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 all black South Side that it has become. Anyway, let I digress. What I want to do tonight, what I'd like to do, is to not talk so much, and I like to listen a little, and I like to see if the crowd that I'm talking to uh, really has the kind of of chops that it, that it takes to be an expert. And I got to say that I wasn't an expert when I started the book. Uh, people asked me, well, why did you write the book? I said, well, I wrote it because I wanted to read it. It didn't exist. Now, let me take that back. I mean, most of the stuff I say I can take back and, 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 and kind of change a little bit because any blanket statement usually uh, 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 is, is subject to subtleties that uh, speakers like Gingrich, I, I don't mean Gingrich, uh, uh, Freudian slip, I meant Romney. <laughs> Romney and, and what's the other guy? What's the other guy? Romney and Ryan. Ryan, right, Romney, Ryan. Speakers like that, they don't, they don't have the, you know, they don't have the need to for subtleties or for truth or anything like that, right? So, but I try to be as truthful as I can be. Uh, and so, what I want to say is that I think that the, uh, there is a need for us to communicate back and forth in this room right now. And I'm going to start the communications with a questionnaire. Everybody here looks like they're pretty well educated, but I mean it may be a facade, but it's a nice facade. And in my quest to in the education of the Caucasian, the first question I'm going to ask is why why did I mention Carter G. Woodson when I made that statement that this title of my uh, uh, talk here is the Education of the Caucasian. Anybody? Anybody? That's because well, Oh, one thing I forgot to uh, say. I'm sorry. I'm going to ask about a dozen questions. Anybody who gets six of those questions right will get a free book. We better learn fast. Okay. So I want everybody to kind of keep track of who's who's answering the questions, right? Because anybody who gets six gets a free book. Okay, the first person to get a free book. So the first person who gets first the si first person who gets six right gets the free book. Right, you got it. Raise your hand. Bingo. Yes, you have to raise your hand. Yes, yes, sir. He was the he was essentially Carter Wilson was essentially the founder of the study of, Af of the history of African Americans in this country. What? And that's why he started what now is Black History Month. It used to be Negro History Week. Did you hear what the man, what the gentleman just said? Repeat it. He said that Carter G. Woodson was the founder of Black, well, was then a Negro History Week that later became uh, Negro History Month, African American History Month uh, that we celebrate to this day. So 
that man gets a point. Okay. <laughs> Give that man a point. And Carter G. Woodson uh, also wrote the book in relation to or well, maybe we shouldn't give them a point. Now that I think about it, <laughs> because the key to this question was: this is like what? What's the one? Jeopardy? Yeah. Where you answer, you give the answer, and then you find out what the question was. The key to this was not that information. It was something else. What else did Carter G. Woodson do that relates to this title? Yes, yes, lady here. He wrote the education of the Negro. You're close, but no cigar. Yes, ma'am. The miseducation of the Negro. You were close, very close. Very close. But it's really far, too. Very far, yes. So who true. gets credit for the question? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Since all three contributed, and all three really had the, had the answer uh, to, to some extent, uh, I will give every... Those three people, one point. Very good. You're already way ahead of the last group I talked about. So Obviously, Cubs fans, no doubt. What? What? Ah. <laughs> okay, now that's one. Okay, we're doing good. So far, we're making um, history here. African American history, I might add. Uh, two, number two. What was the first? and only National Guard Army built for and commanded by African Americans. Okay. Yes, sir, in the back. I'm going to guess because I'm uh, 178 at Cottage Grove in 57. No. No? Close, but no cigar. Not a mile away. What, what, are we, what are we here? The gentleman said, what? What did you say? Half a mile away from Cottage Grove. Yes, and what is it? Tank Drive. I can't give you the number, but I know. I know the armory. It's the building right on 35th Street there. What is it? I keep thinking of it. I go by there all the time. I can't think of the name of the place. It's a school now. Anybody? Yes, sir. Is it the Dawson? Uh, name after Congressman Dawson? No, not Dawson. Are you looking for the division, or are you looking for? I'm looking for the name of the of the armory building. Oh. Is it the, yes, sir. Is it the General Richard Jones Armory? No, sir. It's actually on the street that I was on, which I was born in 1947. 35th and Giles. 35th and Giles. That's, a, that's one of the other questions I'm going to take to relates to that. But what was the first and only National Guard Army built for and commanded by African Americans? And it is now a military academy. You just don't want to give a sleep. <laughs> 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 I went by the building yesterday. I can't well, the, the, I'll tell you the name of the Armory. It is the 8th Regiment Armory. It was built, I think, in about 1915. And the Street Giles, when it was built, it was built on the Street Forest. It became Giles. Wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. I can't tell you that. Okay, I got to modify the third question. So, because so I've who gets a point? The answer. Who gets a point on the second question? What? Who gets a point on the second question? Who gets a point? No points. Okay. No points. Number three. Well, I found the right street. <laughs> that was good. That's a half a point. But I got a quarter of a point. <laughs> I was never good at fractions. Uh, I already gave you the name of the street on which I was born. But who was it named after and why? Anybody? You're good. You, 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 you're on the street all the time. Come on. 
call it in with the gap. I know that. This is true. But the street, which is Giles, I grew up on. I remember when I was a kid uh, playing two streets east there, which you uh, King Drive. Uh, it was South Parkway in that, in that South, South Park Boulevard at that point when I was growing up. And I remember asking about the this, the statue that's right on the corner of 35th and now King Drive. There's a statue there. I used to ask uh, the adults, what is that statue? What, what is that for? And I remember somebody said something, I think it's got something to do with the black soldiers. But I said, black soldiers? I don't know anything about it. I've never heard about black soldiers. I never see black soldiers on in the movies. I never, John Wayne never had any black soldiers fighting with him. So there couldn't have been any black soldiers, right? <laughs> well, let's not get on John. He was a nice guy. Just some people. But the street that I was born on, Giles, was named after. And his name is on, it was when I was in my 40s. And I'm, I'll be 65 in October. When I was in my 40s, I was working on a project because uh, I used to do advertising, graphic design and stuff. I was working on a project and I was doing something about tourism and black tourism. And so I had to read the inscription on the base of the statue on 35th and King Drive. And the statue is called the Victory Monument. And it is a statue to the soldiers who fought and died in Argonne Forest, France in World War I. Nobody on the block that I grew up on knew that, right? The high school that I went to on the corner of 39th and Giles, between Prairie and Giles, is Wendell Phillips High School, which is the first African-American high school in the city of Chicago. Nobody at that school ever told me about the fact that the street was named after an African-American soldier who fought and died the Argonne Forest in France. That's who the street is named after, Lieutenant George L. Giles. He was a resident on Calumet, which is a street right east of Giles, between Giles and King Drive. And the first name on that statue, if you look at it, go there anytime, first name is well, the inscription says, dedicated to the brave soldiers of the of the 8th Regiment Army who fought and died in Argonne Forest, and it says a, a month or a date, 1917. And the first name on the statue is Lieutenant George L. Giles. Okay, so far we got uh, three number ones, one point. Four. Who was the first person, black, white, or other, to perform a successful open heart surgery procedure? Ooh. Anybody? Yes, sir. Was it Dr. Percy Julian? No. No, sir. Provident Hospital. Yes, yes, lady. Dr. Daniel Hill Williams. Could you repeat that real quick from this person? This, this. Excuse me? This lady here was the one? Yes, she's the lady who answered it correctly with Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who was the founder of the of Provident Hospital, which was the first African American uh, directed hospital, even though he founded it not for African Americans in particular. He wanted, he was very ecumenical, and he wanted it to be a hospital for everybody, and it was for a number of years. So we have four people with one point each, right? Right. Very good. So we're, we're making progress. We're making lots of progress here. Number five. Who was the woman who claims to have helped Richard Wright write Native Son and who later wrote a book calling Richard Wright a demonic genius? Anybody? He's a well known writer, poet. She wrote a book. The book came out about 15 years ago. And it was obvious from reading the book, and it was a big book, 
she wrote the book. I'm reading between the lines and I'm reading the book. She really, she says how great he was. She met him here in Chicago when he was here for about 10 years, from 1927 to 37. And uh, I think she, loved Richard Wright, but he never, you know, returned. He, he was he was good, he was nice, they were friends, but it was platonic, and she wanted something else, from what I can tell, but she never says it. And she waited until her husband died, because she was married. After Richard Wright, she was married for years. After her husband died, she wrote this book about which you are calling him a demonic genius. And she says that she helped when Richard Wright moved to New York in 1937, 37, 38. Uh, and he was writing, he was working on Native Son at that point. But he was still writing, still working on it. And she helped him to report a story. The book was based on a true story that happened in Chicago with a guy who murdered uh, a woman and Margaret, uh, Margaret Walker was her name. Margaret Walker is the answer. I gave it away. And she helped him gather newspaper clippings, everything about this story to help him make the story, uh, the story of Bigger Thomas, instead of this guy who did it, his name was, his last name was Nixon. So no points because you gave away the question. I gave right? away the answer in my, in my uh, <laughs> fervor. Then we all get a point. Then we all get a point, right? <laughs> yes. Man, this is a tough crowd. <laughs> I got a tough crowd. We, we, have, we have to have affirmative Man. action for those underperformers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, okay, I'm getting to the easy ones. I'm getting to the easy Okay, here's a, here's a great one. This has got to be, I, I'm going to be embarrassed if nobody gets this. What was the Chicago, no, I'm sorry, who was the Chicago band leader who gave Cab Calloway his first big break? And it was here in Chicago. You make a multiple choice. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Anybody? Uh, Louis Armstrong? Or am I, am I wrong? Was You're wrong, okay. but you tried. Okay. You tried. Okay. You get points for try? No. No. No points. <laughs> Over here. Okay, this is a tough one. Okay. I mean, it's easy, but it's tough. Okay, no, what do you got? Oh, I got two here. Okay. Anybody? I'll just take a guess. No, no. Gail? Benny Goodman? No. No, this is a, oh, no, I know you guys are going the wrong direction now. I mean, this is amazing because I did not know this, and it's still hard to believe. But the person who gave Cab Calloway his first big break here in Chicago in the 1920s was none other than another Callaway, huh. a band leader named Blanche, his older sister. She was already a big time yeah, performer here in Chicago when he came from the East Coast. And she gave him his big break <laughs> here in Chicago. Strange but true. <laughs> okay. So no points on that question, correct? No points. I tried, but no points. I think this is rigged. This is rigged. Well, I didn't know when I didn't know but until I wrote the book because I didn't know eighty percent of the stuff was in the book until I started doing the research. This is rigged. I mean, this is not rigged, it's tough. Hey. I just don't like to embarrass you. Okay, I got the uh, I got one here that I don't even know the answer to. <laughs> I don't know how I did this. I guess my answer's right. <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. I gotta change it. Uh, originally, the, the question was, what was the name of the music store 
where Lil Hardin first met Jelly Roll Morton here in Chicago. Chess records? Who said that? I did. Wrong. Um, <laughs> no, no. That, that, I mean, it, we're talking about it. The difference between when Chess Records was around and this time is about, uh, what, 40 years, about two generations. <laughs> this is way before Chess. But the, 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 I actually, okay, now, okay, I got it. Wait, let me write this down. Because I, I was trying to wing it ex extemporaneously, but it ain't working. Okay, so, I got the name, I, I know the name, but then there was another idea I came up with while I'm doing this. Okay, so, what was the name of the music store where Lil Hardin first met Jelly Roll Morton? She was a music uh, uh, demonstrator in this store. No, this is way, well, Carl might, might have been around, but no, but this one, this is on the south side of Chicago, on the area that's known, that was known then as the Stroll, where all the, the clubs and stuff was along State Street and then branched off 35th Street over, over uh, east to uh, Calumet. State and 35th, you said? Well, yeah, 35th and, and, and State was where the store was. And she was, a, like I said, it was, a, it was a music store, you know, sheet music and, and uh, instruments, I guess. But And she got a job when she was still a teenager and really going to school, still going to school. Uh, and she got a job demonstrating uh, music. Ray's and Music. One day, uh, what? Ray's Music Emporium. Ray's? <laughs> From the Booze Brothers. Yeah. No. See, I see, I missed that part. I I should have got that. That was pretty charming. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it, it was it was you're not far because it, it, it's it's a one syllable word, and it is the Jones Music Store. It's on 35th uh, or near 35th and State. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Starbucks is everywhere. Yeah. Where is some Starbucks? Yes, sir. How is it surprising to you that nobody in this crowd knows about that reference? That's pretty obscure, isn't it? How could you expect us to know that? If we well, this, this looks like, I, I said this looked like a very august group. I said that. I gave you that. So no points on... <laughs> so no points on this question too, correct? What? No points on this question too. You have to give me hiccups. Let me get a drink. Okay, so here we go. But then the, the other thing that came up when I was trying to wing it on this, there's another deal with another music store related to Jelly Roll Morton. That's even more amazing. Jelly Roll Morton, I found this out really after I had done this book. I mentioned Jelly Roll, but I don't mention them in this context in the book. Jelly Roll Morton was actually here in Chicago before Louis Armstrong ever got here. Then he went out to the West Coast. Then he came back. When he came back, Louis Armstrong had just gotten here, I think. But when he came back, he came back partially because when he was on the West Coast, the music that he had been writing since he was even in, in New Orleans, before he even got to Chicago, was starting to get popular. And people were, uh, there was a music, uh, a publisher here in Chicago, a music store right across from the, the Tivoli Theater, uh, that was publishing his music. And he wanted to come to Chicago and find out, hey, who are these guys? I'm not getting any royalties, blah, blah, blah. And he came back, and he walked in with, a, they said, with a big 10-gallon hat on, and he said, hey, I'm Jelly Roll Morton. Everybody, I mean, the guys thought he was faking, right? But then he sat down at the piano, and when he began to play, they knew it was Jelly Roll. And the, the, he made a deal with these guys that he started to, they started to publish a lot more of his music and supposedly give him a piece of the action. But unbeknownst to him, these guys, and the name of the store is the name of the guys. Two brothers. Anybody? The 
brothers were the Melrose brothers. They were the Melrose Music Store. And they ripped uh, Jelly Roll off big time because they were publishing his, his music, but they were also adding lyrics, unbeknownst to him, to his music and getting the publishing uh, uh, credits, getting the royalties as, as, as lyricists for songs that he didn't even know that he never had lyrics to. So they were making all kinds of money off of him for years and years. He didn't even realize it, right? But it was the Melrose Brothers, Melrose Music Store. That's an extra one, so anybody got that would get two points. But it says somebody got it. Were you the negative No. <laughs> Four people with one point each. <laughs> okay, I'm going to throw one in just for fun because I like you. Uh, <laughs> okay, here's, a, here's an easy one. What was the name of the African American filmmaker who was directing and producing movies in Chicago almost 50 years before Spike Lee was born? Ooh, I should know this. I'm going to say out of that one. <laughs> Are you gonna say out of it? Okay, yeah, you hold it hold off a little bit. Anybody? Was he a member of the SNA studio crew? No, no, that's that no, they didn't allow it, the, the people of his color that's that, that far north in those days. <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you give us a name? Can I Well wait a minute, name? anybody else? Anybody else? I think we got a, a ringer in here. Oh, we got maybe. a actually way off. <laughs> And the answer is Sam Greenley. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you, you are. Although that was another answer to one of my the questions on the cards. Is, is, yeah, that's, is, what, is that's what I thought you said. Yeah. No, this was a guy who was making movies, directing and producing movies in Chicago, almost 50 years before Spike Lee was born. Now my daughter Zuri is in the room. She walked in, there she is, back there in blue. And she's gonna to try to answer a question as though she never knew, I never told her the answer. Although she's been in, she's been in all these different things. I know I told her already. But I'll give you the pleasure of... of Does it start with a B? Wait a minute. Last name start with a B? You didn't listen, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear what this man just said? Which one? Siri, listen to this. Listen to the man. Stand up and Oscar, say it. Oscar Michelle. Oscar oh, I'm Michelle. Say Bushow, but it's Michelle. <laughs> Are you going to say Bushell? Yeah, that would have been even worse. <laughs> Michelle. Oscar Michelle. Amazing filmmaker. He made his first film in 1917 at the almost the very beginning of the, of the motion picture uh, silent film industry. Excuse me? Tell us about the film. Well, the film was based on a book that he had written called The Homesteader. It's kind of, it's kind of autobiographical to some extent. But it was, it was interesting because he was at some point, he was born somewhere in, in southern Illinois. But by the time he was in his teens and early 20s, he was a, he had worked a lot of different jobs, but one was a, as a Pullman porter. And that's how, he, when he came to Chicago, he became a Pullman porter and he was traveling. And then he decided that he wanted to, he found out about some land deal, but they were selling cheap land in Nebraska. So he decided that he's gonna make his fortune being a, a, a farmer South in Nebraska, South, South Dakota. He's good. I his house. South Dakota, that's right. Where did I get in Nebraska? Okay, South Dakota. And he uh, tried to make it as a homesteader. And he, he had some problems, he had some problems. He got married in Chicago. He had problems with his wife, was with his wife's father who was a minister and didn't approve of this, whatever, right? So it's a lot, but the the movie is based on 
back on, it, on his autobiographical story. So it was the, uh, the homesteader, Oscar Michaud. Okay, here's another one. Point no points. <laughs> What about this guy? He I got the answer. I read the book already. I don't count. Oh, right. No, he got it. He, oh, that's right. He already read the book. Oh, no wonder he got it. Oh, okay. No, but he said he was he, he was in South Dakota. Okay, that <coughs> counts for something. You also said that Michelle did a film called Within Our Gates, which was an answer film, The Birth of a Nation. Right. So he was a radical filmmaker, too. So yeah. He did a, a film that counter Birth of a Nation, so that's yes. the most famous work. Yes. And who wrote Birth of a Nation? Well, D.W. Griffith. Well, he directed it. it. It was based on a novel. The Klansman. The Klansman by yeah. Thomas Dixon. Right. right. Actually, two novels, Birth of a Nation and The Klansman. Dixon wrote a poem. Well, that wasn't one of the questions, though, was it? Nope. No, it wasn't. No, but the uh, D.W. Okay, here's, this, here's an easy one. Here's an easy one. <laughs> when was the famous Regal Theater built, and how did it compare to the Apollo in New York? Anybody? The Regal Theater. When was the famous Regal Theater built, and how did it compare to the Apollo in terms of size, in terms of when it was built? Whatever, anybody? 1946, Crystal Lake, Illinois. <laughs> That's a stretch. That's a stretch. Well, there was a Regal Theater in Crystal Lake that was built in 1946. Not that one. I said the famous. <laughs> it's infamous in McHenry County. It was famous. Famous in McHenry County. What? 63rd, no. Not 63rd, no. 64th. By, by Stony Island, about 47. 47, and what is now King Drive. 47, yeah. Yes, 40. What was on 69th? Well, the, the new Regal was on 79th. Yeah, it's actually one. Yeah, it's actually the new Regal. That was, I mean, it was another thing. It was, it was the Avalon. Avalon. They turned it into the new Regal. But the original Regal was uh, on 47th. And King Drive, or really just south of 47. The Balbian and Cats Theater, or not? Excuse me. A Balbian and Cats Theater, the guys who made. Well, it was it was it was a, it became a Balbian and Cats, but I think it was built by a, some other group. I think, as far as I can tell, it was built by somebody else, and either they were a sub a, a set of, of Balbian and Cats, a different name. Okay. Of, but I think what happened is this company built it. And Balaban and Cats bought them out, mm -hmm. I think, uh, pretty close to when it was built. Okay. But anyway, the Regal Theater was built in between 1927 and 28. And not only was the theater built, but the Savoy Ballroom was built at the same time. It was a part of an entertainment center built specifically for the African American community in Chicago by whites, because the African American community in Chicago was so big and dynamic and growing in such a great market that they wanted to, they saw big uh, profits in building a first class entertainment venue because African Americans could not go downtown to the first class entertainment venues and be treated, if they were let in at all, be treated uh, nicely and fairly. So, they saw an opportunity, and they built the first uh, uh, first class entertainment um, uh, building and complex in America, and they built it for African Americans in, in Chicago, not in Harlem. How did you compare the pattern of the Apollo? No, that's part of the the, 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 the information is that how it compared is that it was built in 1927 from the ground, 27, 28, from the ground up, specifically for the African American community. The Apollo was not built for African Americans. It was a theater, just a general theater, and it was smaller, and it was, and it was converted into a um, African American theater after the Harlem became more and more black. 
and it was uh, the 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 Apollo was about 1,800 uh, seats, and the um, New Eagle was about I think 2,700, 2,800. So it was much bigger. The, uh, the Regal was. So for African Americans and entertainment, the Regal was really the show, and it was part of a complex. It was Regal and the Savoy Ballroom. And there was a Savoy in New York as well, but this was a complex that was the Regal and the Savoy in one place, and then an office building. And it, was, it was a major uh, uh, building project. And um, so this, uh, so it, this is another example of the kind of thing that I found, the kind of, of information that we think of New York and Harlem as being the quintessential African American community, but in many ways Chicago and the South Side in particular was the really the vibrant, the most vibrant and independent. African American community, and much more, uh, it's seen much more business, uh, self generated business within the community, black owned businesses in the community. And an example of this is the next question I have uh, related to that is where did the Harlem, where did the Harlem Globetrotters get started? At the Savoy. <laughs> Listen to that man, what did, he, what did he say? He said, at the Savoy. What do you mean? At the Savoy that you just mentioned in, mm -hmm. in Chicago. And what were they called um, when they were when they started? And where were they from? Where did they start even before? What high school did they come from? Now he asked one question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm giving him another shot at it. Double points on this one. <laughs> uh, the only school I could think of maybe is uh, Alpha? Wendell Phillips High, which is the same high school that I attended, by the way. Not that I'm a, much of a basketball player these days, or ever for that matter. Anyway, so Harlem Globetrotters. From the south side of Chicago. Well, how did they become the Harlem Globetrotters? Why weren't they the Bronzeville Globetrotters? <laughs> you hear what the lady said? Because people never heard of Bronzeville. Harlem was hot. This is the 1920s when they when they started. By 1925, when they became the Harlem 25, 26, when they became the Harlem Globetrotters. And it was because they were the Savoy Big Five. After they came out of the Wendell Phillips High School, they became the Savoy Big Five. And they were playing in the Savoy Ballroom. And Abe Saperstein was a guy who was, tr was trying to get, a, get a, uh, a team together and to manage a team. He became their manager. He's the guy that came up with the idea what was happening then? The Harlem Renaissance was happening in, in the 1920s, 25, 26, all the way through the 19, early 30s. So he says, everybody knows about Harlem, black folks Harlem, black folks Harlem. Nobody knows about Bronzeville. <laughs> Why? Because Harlem is in the media capital of, of, of America. Right? New York City. <laughs> So, of course, they hype stuff forever, right? The hype capital of the world. So he says, hey, let's make them the Harlem Globetrotters. And I remember my father, he went to Phillips, he used to hang out with Nat King Cole, and, and he know, knew a, a lot of these people because they were all in the same place. And he used to tell me that. He'd tell all the, the Globetrotters, you know, they, Phillips. And I said, come on. You know, I didn't, I didn't believe him. He told me a whole bunch of stuff that I said, ah, oh, come on. Because it was never confirmed any place in any book that I had ever seen. The high schools didn't mention it. In the very area that all this happened, they didn't say a word. I said, what's that about? 
Yes, sir. Washington generals also come from uh, the, the Washington generals? The, the team that they always played, the Washington generals or whatever? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. The Washington General was a passive for the Holly Gold Trot. In other words, mm -hmm. they would travel with the Gold Trot. Right. They may they have. Also from they the may States. have. No, no, no. They didn't travel with the Gold Trot. Not the, yeah. I mean, generally, I mean, people come from all over the world. But I mean, generally, not like the Gold Trot, they went from Chicago. Okay, I got an easy one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I've got an easy one for you. Who was the first non-native settler in the Chicago area? Oh, wait, wait a minute. Got to raise your hand. The gentleman back there, first hand raise. John Point the Baptiste du Sable. There you go. One point for the man. And where did he settle? Where was his, was his camp? Just north of the Chicago River where Michigan Avenue is right now. Okay, you got that. Do you agree with him? Yes. Pioneer Court now. Right, Pioneer Court. Okay, give both of those gentlemen a point on that one. So who's still keeping track? 1772. No, I remember it well. Okay. Okay, now this is a tough one. I would, I would be very shocked if anybody even raises their hand on this one. What was the name of the musician? A contemporary and rival of Scott Joplin. Everybody knows who Scott Joplin is, right? Okay, what was the name of the musician, a contemporary and rival of Scott Joplin, who built his own office building on the south side of Chicago in 1917, the year Joplin died penniless in New York? Yes, sir. Was it Anthony Overton? No, sir. But he, but Anthony Overton wasn't a musician, but he did build a building similar in size to the one this gentleman, and probably within about a block of this this gentleman's building. Where was the building located? The building was on about 36th place, or 37th and uh, State Street. Because so most of the buildings were along State Street. Near 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 the uh, near the. Uh, uh, the what? No, it's not there. I was thinking it may have been near Pullman District. Well, it's been torn down. It's, it's, it's no, it's on 35th, near 35th, 37th, 38th. Okay. Okay. The name of the building and the name of the gentleman, an amazing story. His name was Joe Jordan. And he was a music musician, uh, a band leader. He was the director of the Pekin Theater, which was the first African-American stock theater in the country. It was down on 27th and, and State, uh, which what is now, or what was, Dearborn Homes uh, housing project. Uh, and this, <laughs> this guy was a uh, worldwide uh, musician, uh, band director, music director, composer. He traveled all over the world. He worked in New York with Yubi Blake, people like that. Amazing. And he went on, he, after he left, to, left Chicago, he went into real estate on the West Coast. And I need to find out more, but he was a, a, an, exactly in terms of his talent and his skill, he was very similar to Scott Joplin. Scott Joplin died uh, like it's a poor, they say he had uh, a venereal disease when he died, in bad shape. When he was in Chicago, he had a hard time even surviving in Chicago. And, and, and this guy, Joe Jordan, was going like that. But Joe Jordan, nobody knows about. Scott Joplin is world famous. Go figure. But the music, too. He's an amazing uh, musician, but, uh, but you know, talent is uh, ain't enough. Okay, we're near the end. We got one more question. Okay. This is really tough. All right. Oh, this is, I'm shaking in my boots on this one. 
<laughs> Who was the African American World War I veteran and lawyer said to have been gunned down by Al Capone's gang in cahoots with the Chicago police and Mayor Big Bill Thompson during the Roaring Twenties because he had the nerve to run for election against one of their big candidates? <coughs> this one is very obscure. <laughs> Anybody? And when they tried these guys, the police officers, this, now this is what happened, at least the stories that, that I've read. He votes, standing in front of the polling place in broad daylight, this guy voted for himself, of course, and he starts hearing these shots, and he looks, and these guys are in the car shooting at him. So he jumps into his car. He's got some other guys with him who are young guys who are his, his, like helpers and, and young uh, uh, attorneys or studying to be attorneys. Jump into the car. They try to get away. The, the uh, Al Capone guys, followed by the cops, chase them down. He runs into a tree. They get out and they shoot him with a, either some uh, accounts say a shotgun, others say machine gun. And they just kill him right there. When they have the trial, everybody walks. Nobody gets any time. This is why they called it the Roaring Twenties. I used to I used to watch the Untouchables on television, and I said, Oh, you know, I didn't realize it was in Chicago when I was a kid. I'm watching the match. Oh, this is great fun. But I thought, Well, you know, this couldn't be. I got out. It, couldn't have, it was worse than the untouchable ghost. The stuff that was happening here is, is almost unbelievable. And you, and you wonder why Chicago has such a bad reputation still, because they were doing some scandalous stuff in those days. Yeah, I don't know, of course, not like today. Anyway, uh, that's my story. Question yes. time. Okay, give us a little bit about your background why you wrote the book, and how you became... Oh, well, people want to know the answer? Yeah. yeah. Anybody? Yeah. It's amazing. His name was Octavius Granity. Octavius Granity. And if you look it up, you only find verses in some of the most uh, uh, complete, comprehensive books. They'll have a reference. They'll probably have maybe... Uh, a paragraph or two about it. It was during what they called the pineapple primaries, when they were throwing pineapples or grenades and, uh, and blowing up all kinds of stuff. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I read a book, uh, and I forget the author's first name, but I'm sure his last name was Thompson. And oh, you're talking about uh, the king. Yeah, yeah, the policy kings, Nathan Thompson. Is that Nathan, right? We're not related, but yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, Nathan Thompson. Now, again, I just, for the purposes of the tape and, and a few things, give us your name, a little bit about your background and why you wrote the book. Okay. My name is Lowell Thompson, and uh, I am a lifelong Chicagoan, as I said. And uh, my background is I was born. Southside Chicago, family of 11 kids. Uh, moved to Robert Taylor Homes when it was first built in 19, about 61 or 62, I was about 12, about 13, 14 years old when we moved in. And, uh, but at the age of 20, because I had a little bit of art talent, a little, I had a little art talent and I had gone to the School of the Art Institute for a short time, had a scholarship there in the, uh, the University of Chicago. But I dropped out real quick. I had to make some money, you know, I had to feed the, uh, myself and, and help family. And I wasn't that academically inclined anyway, so at least not that kind of uh, academics. And so 
I wound up getting into the advertising agency business right after Dr. King was killed in Memphis and the riots that happened. I had gotten a job uh, just before that as an office boy in the creative services department of, a, of the Chicago Tribune. And I got the job in, in January of 68. In, in April of 68, Dr. King was killed. The riots happened. And for the first time, corporate America opened itself up to African Americans. They called you an office boy? Yeah, I was an office boy in 1968. Yeah, in those days, everybody was an office boy, except the girls. So, and they didn't, and they didn't hire girls. So, so I got the job uh, because if I had been there three months before, six months before, African American, they would have sent me to the mail room or someplace. But because of this incident. And the riots that happened and the fact that the United States was up for grabs in a lot of people's minds and the Cold War was on, you know, and uh, uh, or the, the, the fight with the communists was still on. And America, it just became, I guess, too embarrassing and just too blatant, the kind of, of, of uh, uh, disparity uh, and the fear of, of violence that corporate America opened itself up for a, a brief moment, one brief shining moment, and some people like me walked in. That's how I got into the advertising agency business. And once I got in and I saw what was going on, I said, hey, this is for me. So I became an advertising man, one of the first few African Americans working in the major ad agencies. I'm talking about I worked for six of the top 10 ad agencies in the world, but in the Chicago office. Jay Walt, anybody knows anything about advertising? Jay Walter Thompson, Leo Burnett, Foot Conan Belden, these are the top of the line ad agencies. I worked at all of them as a creative person, an art director, and then an art supervisor, then a, a, like a supervisor of both art and copy, and I uh, became a VP of uh, Burrell, which is the largest black owned ad agency. But I worked primarily. Uh, most of my career for white agencies. Just as a corollary, what was your most successful campaign? Well, one that most people probably would, would know was the uh, Dub Bulls campaign for the Chicago Bulls. And uh, that was in, in the 90s. I just suffered McDonald's and Coke and all kinds of people, uh, some of which ran for craft foods. Um, and, you know, print, outdoor, all kinds of stuff related to uh, you know, selling those products. So that's my background, and I call myself now these days a recovering ad man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we got questions. Let's uh, yes. keep. Okay, uh, who else has a question? That gentleman there. Yes, yeah, Bill. How come you haven't said anything about urban renewal? Urban renewal. That's a big question. That's and that's a big subject of my book. And I have stuff about urban renewal in the book, but the book, if you've seen it, it is primarily a, uh, a visual uh, pictorial history. And I have most of my text comes off of the images that I could get and I find. I have a series of images in the book that are of vacant lots. And that's my urban renewal stuff. I have stuff about what happened, uh, how these lots became vacant, why they became vacant, and why they're still vacant. So it does have something about urban renewal, but it doesn't have uh, any specific in-depth uh, information or any new information about uh, or research about urban renewal. It talks a little bit, uh, makes reference to the University of Chicago to some extent, but not much. But that would be, uh, that's two, three, four, five books. Okay. Questions. Questions, come on. All right, I got, I got one more. Why, why is it then that, you know, uh, the, the black people have a, a certain culture that guys like me who are white can't understand 
And one of the things that, that I can't quite grasp yet is, you know, I know it took a long time after the Civil War, and I don't con really consider the blacks really winning until the 60s when they had the civil rights mm -hmm. thing coming in. But why is it that, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's just... I often, with some of my black friends at work, there's just a culture of non-achievement. Mm -hmm. And can you speak to that? And am I wrong in thinking that there's a somewhat of a culture of non-achievement, or would I be uh, misguided in that perception? Well, that's a good question. And, you know. Well, that's what I'm a, I'm a suburbanite. I understand. Okay. This is this is why I'm asking you. Well, no, but, that, but that's a good question, and it's a question that probably I would guess that most uh, whites would think, if not ask. And I've spent about 20 years when I went from being ad man to my transformation into what I now call race man, okay. thinking about this and, and studying it because I mean, that's a, uh, something to be, to be thought about, right? Mm -hmm. And the best that I've come up with, excuse me, is that if you know anything about the history of this country and how African Americans first got here, and then how many years they was, were spent, where the people in charge, the people who ran the country basically, were actively, aggressively, consistently, persistently trying to turn African Americans into beasts of burden and subhumans. Mm -hmm. You start with the 1619 when the first, uh, let's say the first 20 African Americans first landed in Jamestown. From 1619 through uh, the 1860s, Civil War, mm -hmm which is what, 200 some years. Right. Uh, African Americans were considered less than human in this country. And they were considered less than human, not by the average or even the poor whites. It was by the people like Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. who basically made his, it his business, literally his business, to try to make African Americans into beasts of burden and only be subverted. All the religious institutions, or most of the religious institutions, most of the most of the in, in, industrial institutions, most of the educational institutions, all of them were dedicated to the idea that African Americans should be treated as subhumans, and that they promoted the idea to every American, including African Americans, mm -hmm. that they were subhumans. So you're talking about 200 and some years of that kind of brainwashing, or attempted brainwashing. But that's not all. Wait a minute, there's more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then after the 1860s, when African Americans were supposedly freed to then become sharecroppers and, and still be uh, uh, as some gentleman who wrote a book recently, a uh, guy from the Wall Street Journal, uh, wrote a book called uh, Worse Than Slavery. Uh, um, they were then treated as, as a little better than, than, than beasts of burden, but then cheated. Instead of, of legally being, being treated as subhumans, they were then illegally treated as subhuman. And every institution, the minstrel shows, this gentleman here just wrote a book about minstrels, minstrel shows. Okay. And the minstrel shows, the education system, the religious system, all of these systems in America basically still were dedicated to the idea that African Americans were subhumans. The first time that African Americans actually were even treated legally as equal, on paper, mm -hmm. legally 
supposedly equal, was after the Civil Rights Act in 1964, I believe. Okay. And so you're talking about how long, how many years is that? Less than probably 40 years, thereabouts. And like We're talking about, less, about 40 years that, in terms of legally on paper, we are supposed to be treated as equals. But we all know that what's on paper mm -hmm. and what's in reality are not the same, right? Right. So I ask you the question, My why is it that African Americans are perceived by many whites to be not up to par, not working hard enough, not doing enough. And I said perceived to be, because you have to remember that still, right now, today, mm -hmm. I wrote this book, African Americans in Chicago. How many people in the media, the only person in the major media who covered the book, is a guy that's kind of like a friend of mine, Rick Kogan. And he wrote a story about me, put me on uh, his show, on WGN, on radio, and whatever. But WBEZ, uh, Channel uh, 11, all the major newspapers, none of them think it's important to cover the, at the same time they're covering the murders and, the, and the, all the gang activity, do you think it's important to, to uh, have a book that shows African Americans uh, some other side of African Americans? No, why? So my answer to your question is that question. Okay. Why well, do you think, why is it, uh, what do you think is the result of that kind of, of overwhelming, overwhelmingly negative uh, uh, brainwashing? I, I worked on another book called Brainwash. Thank you very much for that You're comprehensive welcome. answer. Can I reflect on that, uh, what Neil Tyson the Grass, the, the great astrophysicist, um, said about that? There was a question in a conference about women. Why are women not into... What? Actually, the question was, what is it with broads and sides? <laughs> and um, <laughs> Neil deGrasse's response was, I've never been a woman, but I've been black all my life. <laughs> and he tells how in school, he went in school and a lot of his friends, and they were always encouraged to, to play basketball well, um, to be good at sports, now, uh, Neil was, was lucky because his parents, he comes from a very educated and, and well-to-do family. Uh, others will not. So when he got, a day, a, one day at the end of high school, and he was a straight A student, they asked him, what do you want to do when you graduate? And he said to the teacher <coughs> scientist, and she came behind him and said, Neil, I thought you wanted to play basketball. This is the answer. That, you know, with no encouragement, and, I mean, people just can't, uh, not everybody has the strength to resist and to do in spite of, in spite of. Walter? In regards to what Timothy was saying about blacks with their cultural failure, modern day blacks, I wonder if you'd agree with what I'm about to say. Uh, when your neighborhood, say the neighborhood alongside the South Side Elevated, that was always known as a zone of emergence. First you had uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and Irish and uh, Russian Jews and German Jews, not always in that order. But uh, these zones, it was, is, still is, should be a zone of emergence, but and later, in the later years, uh, jobs have just completely disappeared. Now we have blacks living in the zone of emergence there. There are no jobs. The stockyards are gone. There are no more streetcar conductors. <coughs> nobody to shovel coal into buildings. So would you agree that is why we see unsuccessful blacks today? Well, that's there's a big part. no jobs out there. That's why. Yeah, of course. There's, there's, there's definitely uh, a difference. 
uh, in terms of jobs, and especially for people who are not very highly educated and not from very successful, already successful families, uh, of course. Um, and, and also, but it's, there's also still the culture in this country that nobody wants to acknowledge, even blacks or people like Obama, Barack Obama, don't want to acknowledge because you know it's like the third rail of politics <coughs> to talk about for a black guy, the president, to talk about race. You don't say race. Don't say the R word, right? Right. Because the Americans, the average American, especially uh, white American, middle class, upper middle class, white, and a lot of middle class blacks don't want to acknowledge the fact that this country was, was started as a white supremacist culture and that it still is. Less blatant, even with the President of the United States being an African American, the culture is still a white supremacist culture. Nobody wants to address it. Nobody, I mean, that's, don't talk about white supremacism. It's not even racism. I don't even talk about mm -hmm. racism as much now as I do the idea that a, uh, your, the color of your epidermis and the texture of your hair makes you supreme. I mean, think about it. Right. That's basically what, what white supremacy, the, the color of, of your skin, the upper layer of your skin, and the texture of your hair makes you supreme. Nothing else. That's the concept of white supremacy. And we still have it in this country. Uh, Bernie? Yes, could you comment on the apparent new wave of government-sponsored racism, most notably some states wanting to require uh, strict identification of, uh, That's not racism, that's politics. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe a fine line between the two. But to try and restrict African voters from voting. I'm poor voters, and Latino voters, it's politics. Yeah, it's, it's, it's politics, of course. I mean, like, I always look at Obama, and I voted for him, you know, and I'm working on something to get him reelected right now. Got a few ideas, right? I had to go back and, uh, you know, I wanted to get out, but I couldn't, uh, into my ad advertising man bag to get him reelected, right? But I see Obama. That's the way. This guy is one of the smart politicians from Chicago. They always put that. He's a Chicago, select like Chicago politician. So here he goes to 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 uh, Washington. And what does he do? He's got a year and a half, almost two years, where he actually has a majority in both uh, 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 sides of Congress. And what does he do? He joins hands. Wants to join hands with Mitch McConnell. And, and, and Paul Ryan and those guys are saying uh, uh, okay? uh, kumbaya. <laughs> I'm saying, wait a minute. Politics, we're talking about, we're not talking about uh, racism, we're talking about power and politics. And that trumps everything. I mean, the whole idea, I, I'm writing, I'm working on a, uh, a, a idea right now and it relates to that and it, and it relates the I say racism uh, is color-coded classism, and racism is not personal. The people who created this idea of white supremacy didn't do it because they liked white people, or they liked the pink people they called white. They did it the same reason why uh, General Motors makes cars, why Microsoft made, uh, made software for money and power. And they use and they, and they use whatever it takes, and if it takes turning a, a portion of the human species into into subhumans, that's what they did. If they if they found that the best way to make money is to now switch it and make the so-called blacks the the supreme people, and the whites uh, uh, the subhumans, they would do that. Thank you, Mike Foley. For many years. The CHA has been tearing down high-rise housing project buildings. Where do those people go to live? They're going further and further south, and they're moving back down south, and they're on the streets, 
they're, 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 they are trying to, uh, what, what I used to call Bobby Taylor homes, is it, got, it, it was okay when I first moved in. But because they don't maintain it, because they don't have the police, because they got, uh, they, they forget about it. They basically turn those people, and they turn the places that they live into slow death camps. You heard of death camps? Oh, yeah. I'm talking about slow death camps. And they want those people, the same thing that, that Thomas Jefferson wanted to do, that Abraham Lincoln wanted to do, send them back to Africa, get rid of them, we've used them, we've used them up, we make the money in the easy gains, the easy money off of these people. Now, let them die. That's what Jefferson was, 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 was thinking. Hey, they're not gonna be able to compete with the whites because the whites are so superior that they will just die off. And that's basically what they're doing here in Chicago and they do all over the country. And the ones that happen to be able to survive, they happen to get lucky or, or have some political uh, connection and, and, or it can be the shills for the politicians. They get a nice house and whatever and they shut up and don't say anything. The other ones die. Tim? Okay, I also remember an interesting conversation in a college class where, you know, the black students in there were talking about black people who became, quote, white. Right. And they were not actively part of the black community. And I found myself kind of awed that the black race at that time during that particular conversation struck me as more racist than some of my right friends were. Can you comment, please? Well, these are honorary white folks. And of course, I mean, <laughs> well, the same thing with Jews. I mean, there are Jews that, that have assimilated, right? Every group, there's going to be a percentage of the, of the group that assimilates into the power structure of whoever's in power. And, and some of them will do it reluctantly. Some of them will do it and, and still understand where they're from, but they'll play the role to the point where they won't do anything to counter the realities. Every group would do that. And the whole concept of race. I mean, I talk about white and black, but, but, mm -hmm. but like, as I said, you know, I call them uh, pink, pink people. Why, why, why aren't you called pink people? Instead of white people, where's the white come from? You know, you're not white, I'm an artist. You're not white, I'm mm -hmm. not black. Where did that come from? So the whole, what they call reification, the whole idea that, okay, we're going to call these guys, they're all like this, and they're in this category, and if we say it long enough, I'm an ad guy, say it long enough and hard enough and, 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 and well enough, they'll start believing it. And the next generation, of course, will believe it. Anybody that had any link to the reality of what it was, they're dead. They've forgotten, or they've finally learned, and you better go along to get along. You have to be, what, uh, what is it, from, from the uh, South Pacific. They have to be taught. Carefully taught. Carefully taught. All right, uh, Francisco. Yeah, uh, I, I understand you have a very deep understanding of things, but I want to ask a question. I feel like blocks, or white, or yellow, are being used by this system that have been taking over the whole world, the right. corporates. So we are all, whether we admit it or not, here some people defend to be fucked every day, but we are all being fucked every day by the corporation, <laughs> by, the, by the government. It's not funny, it hurts. Absolutely. And uh, so, my, my question is, do you see a uh, near future, maybe in the next 20, 30, 40 years, that we can reverse this and to have some kind of equal distribution of the productivity of each human being, not being robbed and fucked and, and destroyed and thrown away in the garbage? Well, <coughs> I'm an optimist. So, and I'm, I, I, like I said, when I went from being ad man to race man and started to, what part of my transformation was to say, hey, do I want to spend my time thinking about this issue of race, which is so uh, difficult to think about and so hard 
and, and so negative. But once I thought about it as a creative person, as I did coming up with ideas for McDonald's or mm -hmm. Coca-Cola, trying to come up with a new commercial, it's fun to do that. And once I started to say, well, hey, why don't I start looking at racism, which normally is a negative, and the only time most blacks think about race is when they're confronted with it, when a cop stops them <coughs> and, and <coughs> makes them get out of the car for nothing, when a, when a waiter won't wait on them, or when they look kind of funny at them when they walk into a restaurant. That's the only time most black people think about race, and it's always a negative thing. So what I did was that I'm going to make it a positive thing, and I'm going to make thinking about race creative and coming up with ways to undo the damage. So that's what I've been doing for almost 20 years. And so to your question, I'm an optimist because I've been thinking about it, and I've come up with ways to help undo it. This book is just a small portion of it, but there are, there are other things that I'm working on in terms of what I do as an artist, a writer, and a creative person, that I see that, yeah, there are ways to make things better. They're never going to be perfect because humans are not perfect. Because human beings, part of the problem is that I think humans look for somebody to be the answer, to have the answer. And there is no human being who is the answer. There's only us. And all we have is the ability to balance the worst in us against the best in us and come out more consistently on the best in us side. And uh, getting leaders or appointing leaders, part of the process is, is looking for leaders who bring out the best and who lead to the best, but still having the ability as an individual to say, okay, that guy's going too far this way or that way. We have the basic system in place the idea of a democratic republic, the problem is that it doesn't exist here. This is not a democracy. I mean, the, very, the fact that this politicians can get up and say, in this great democracy, and people don't laugh them off the stage or uh, kick them off the stage, shows just how ignorant we are. Okay. Uh, Michael Patrick has a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is actually my first time ever being in one of these conversations, and probably one of the youngest members as well. Oh, right. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> kind of just trying to, just kind of trying to go back to uh, what he had mentioned a long time ago. And um, from my observation, you know, I'm, I'm a foreigner, I'm from a different country. My observation of how this country works is that most people in general, like perception is what matters. And it's in, in terms of this country, it's like perception of what the tech perception is like, what is portrayed in the media. And you brought up questions that, how come it seems like it's no, it hasn't been, you know, so within the black community, black people that have achieved, you know, a lot. Which is, it can easily, you can easily say that because of what you see, what is being portrayed out there. But if you actually been in the community, actually talk to people in the community, Within the black community itself, there are people that have actually achieved a lot, but you don't see that in the media. It's not being portrayed in the media because it doesn't sell. Right. It doesn't sell in the media. You know, being a young, right successful now. black person doesn't sell in the media. Right. Well, that's my book is an example. Like as right. I said, the book is positive. It's got a lot of information right. in there for everybody. It's not just for black folks. And yet, the media. The only person who's actually in the general media who's embraced it is Rick Kogan. And everybody else, even in the black media, they at once, and the black media then takes on the, the 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 covering of the general media, and they follow whatever the general media is doing, and they tend to ignore it until the general media says, "Oh, this is a big thing. This is important, right?" So, as you said, Michael said, "Hey, that's the reality. You don't see it." It doesn't exist, it's not, it doesn't make money, uh, it doesn't conform to the conception or perception that people already have, so why bother, why upset the cart, the money-making cart, by saying, hey, you know, here's information that you don't know, that you should know. Okay. Sorry? 
Uh, my daughter wants to say something. Just, just to add on to all of these points about his original question, because I think you mentioned people that you work with. Yes, that's something. So you may work with some lazy people. You know what I mean? There's there are lazy black people, but there's also lazy white people, lazy Asian people, and right. you know whatever else. But this idea that the if you don't encounter a group, right. you know that often, and when you do, they speak for the entire group of people is absurd. You know, yeah. so. They may be lazy, but everyone is it. <laughs> Thank you for the comment. And I, you know, I just. Gene Walker. Yeah. Thank you very much. You close. Uh, he would critique a movie. He said it started this way and ended that way. It started slow, but you're a roll. And I, I got to ask this question. You used the word. But you're old enough to remember when we was Negroes, color, Afro American, mm -hmm. and, and black. Now, you use the word African American. Uh, what do you think about that name, man? What do you think about that history of naming us? Well, that's a good, that's a, that's a whole discussion. <laughs> but I use the word a lot now Afro American. Afro American. Not African American, Afro American, and then I use a shortened version, which is AFAMS or AFRAMS, with a capital A for the AMS. And I do it because I think the, the hyphenated African American, or just the word African American, to me is maybe the most accurate uh, way to describe us. Not black, because we're not black. I mean, like I said, I'm an artist. <laughs> and I seldom see anybody who I would describe on site as being black. Where did that come from? The idea of calling us black. Well, the slave masters called us black. Negro is just a, a, another word, a Spanish word for black. So in, in naming ourselves, my name so far is African Americans or Afro Americans of Afrohams. And it's because we are African, uh, we're people of African descent, the continent of Africa. And we are in America, and we are an amalgam of both of those now. We are not African by any stretch of the imagination. I know Africans, and I ain't one of them. Not that I say that I'm saying I'm better than them, but I'm not an African. They don't want it's a different culture, and they would and they would tell me, "Hey, you're not an African. You know, you calling yourself an African? Don't you know you're not an African? And an African and Africa is so many different cultures. Africa is a big continent, and there's all kinds of of, of people and countries in Africa, and they're all kinds of cultures. So the whole idea." You know that, that that we can, but but as it relates to a name in this country for us, because we don't know where specifically in Africa we came from at this point. Okay, a, that was a good answer, mm -hmm. and, and and I can see, like you mentioned about the people that fit in in order to achieve what they want to. Mm -hmm. It's you comfortable with it, right? I, I don't I, personally. I ask because personally, I don't like it. I wasn't born in no motherfucking Africa. <laughs> I'm born in the United States. So what would be your name? Huh? What would be the name that you would? Whatever they call it. If a guy's born in Brazil, he's a Brazilian. Uh -huh. If he was born in Mexico, he's a Mexi <laughs> Mexicano. Or uh, if he's a woman, he's a Mexi Mexicana. Uh -huh. so, so I mean, uh, I ain't uh, uh, carried. The guy that ran for president, mm -hmm. his wife was born in Africa. She is an African American, not me. Okay, so you're an, you're an American. Yeah. If you gonna call me, no, call, no, 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 call me Slim, call me Sunshine, call me anything except a, 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 a child of God. I wasn't born there. I don't know why somebody wants to call me African American. Well, fuck you, Slim. Well, but, it, but, but, it, but it's a it's a, it's the same it's the same thing. Yeah. It's the same as somebody calling uh, someone an Italian American. Mm -hmm. okay. But that's 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 a little different. What, what, what I just feel, yeah. 
if, if you want to be a little specific, like in any conversation, mm -hmm. anything, you, you, you got to, uh, as the philosopher said, you started with the, the general, uh, particularly you went to the general back, but and so forth and so on. There's a time you can refer to me as being different or uh, uh, African, but ain't nothing in the books, the dictionary, that said that if you were born in this, you born in England, they're supposed to call you a German. Ain't nothing in the book. So, mm -hmm. so it's inconsistent. I wasn't born in no goddamn African. My father wasn't born there. My grandfather wasn't born there. So but there are people that were, as I said, to be consistent, there are people of Irish uh, descent or heritage, uh, Italian heritage, and who are not first generation, but a third or fourth, second, uh, or fifth generation in, uh, in America, who still call themselves Italian American when somebody asks them what is their heritage? I'm Italian American. Or I'm, I'm Irish, Italian, German American. No, I, I admit it that there is mm -hmm. a situation where I would, uh, you could, if I went to a church, uh, we started an organization, you want to call it or say your name. Right. In that little uh, a close knit situation. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying for the, the government, the whole goddamn country, don't call me an African American. I, you know what I'm saying? On, in other words, his his paper, you put it up, it's a little right now, African America. Mm -hmm. And I gotta put X there. If I you know, I have to go I put go fuck yourself there. That's it. <laughs> see, see this this is a long conversation. Yeah, well that's all I, I, I said your yeah. role, but in, 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 listen, I ain't got no this ain't no uh, No, I think I debate you I'm just saying I wanted because I asked a few other black people and, and, and you ain't the only one that said, Well, I, I kinda like but okay. Let's let's go to report. Let's just question. When you finish, what you said, I can't quote what you said, but when you finish, you accept it okay. as being the best name right. possible. Uh, well, to now, if you got something better, hey, I said, hey, that's right, right. Like that. Yeah, well, me and you are the same thing. <laughs> okay. Give us your daughter's name real quick and introduce her. Zuri. Zuri Thompson. Z U R I. Thank you for coming. She's a lot prettier than you. Well, we try to think you have a question. Yeah, well, what I wanted to ask you was you mentioned that when you were a young person and you were walking with some adults, that you looked at the statue and you said, What is that? And they didn't know. Mm -hmm. These were black people. Mm -hmm. Now this, to me, relates back to what Gene just said. Black people in Chicago, this is talk was supposed to be about education of blacks in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We don't know those things, but what we really don't know is who we are, because we've been given all of these names. Wouldn't you agree with that? I agree with Gene. I'm not an African American. Mm -hmm. I think that the black people in America are the only true Americans because this race, our race, was created right here. It was the coming together of the blacks, the Hispanics, the, the Jews, the everybody. Everybody came together, did their thing, and here we come. I can't trace anybody back to Africa. She might be able to, and she's considered a white woman or an Hispanic woman, but I can't. So I agree with Jean. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah, and that's something that I think, don't you think, since you are a writer and a creator and you're dealing mm -hmm. with people on those levels, that that's not something that should be addressed I think, on a higher level? I think that's something that's valid that should be talked about and, and addressed, yeah. All right. Let's get one more question and get into rebuttals, Brom. Yeah, you start, Carl. I know, I know. <laughs> We're going to have a rebuttal period where you get a chance to get up. You started it. I know I started it, but. Just a moment. <laughs> Okay. I, I want to know from your perspective is the uh, uh, the struggle for uh, gay rights and uh, equality and gay and marriage seems like marriage is similar to what the, the struggle was for civil rights. Well, I think it, it has similarities, but it's not the same, and it's it's important. Why? Why? Well, it's a, it's a long story. I mean, there, there are all kinds of, of differences and nuances that 
in principle, like I said, in principle, there are similarities, but there are nuances and there are things that are different that should not be so easily uh, just lumped into. These are, it's like saying that, okay, because you are a, uh, of some ethnic uh, group, that your culture and your customs are the same as this other. And, and what, it's not. They, they are all different. They all have differences. They all have peculiarities. And like I said, because they are in principle similar, they are not the same. And we could talk about, I mean, we could spend the next five hours talking about what the differences are, uh, but they are not the same. As far as I am concerned, they're not the same. There are similarities. Okay, right over here, Brom. Brom, he hasn't had a question yet. Okay. Oh, sir, does the media deliberately try to create racial tension? No, I think the media tries to avoid race, period. I think the media is part of the, the corporate structure of the country, and there is no money in race anymore uh, talking about it. There's no money in it, except if it is, is for a sensationalistic That's uh, headline, I mean. maybe. Yeah. But even there, I mean, they're not talking about race. They're talking about something that will sell papers, and if it's a uh, black to say, well, hey, people, they don't even have to mention black these days on the South. They say South Side shooting. And what do you think? Okay, black folks just kill somebody, right? And they use black people or use violence as just a way to sell papers. And it's not personal. Yeah, it's just like when it's black on black violence, you don't hear about it. Um, Right. It's, well, it's not that important. It's not news. Well, it's it's like in California, there were nine police officers beat a white homeless man, and I was never on, was, mm -hmm. wasn't all over the media. But you take an incident like the Zimmerman incident, and it's like all over the place. Right. Um, but that's a. I think once you think about the the overall history of why the media is the way it is, not just in terms of race, but in terms of everything. Once you understand that it's, the media has no responsibility to do anything but to make money and to keep publishing right. or to keep stuff on the air. Mm -hmm. They make their money primarily through what I did, advertising, right? And so we think that they have some kind of, some kind of obligation to tell us the truth. They don't. Yeah. They got an obligation to make money, period. And even the so-called public media now is so... Yeah. so much sponsored by and owned by corporations that even they really, when you look at it, they don't deal with, with like WBEZ, mm -hmm. uh, here in Chicago, supposedly public uh, yeah. radio, and yet yes, they, uh, trying to get any coverage from them, on my book, or on anything, that it's not their own version of <laughs> okay, this is what black people are about. This is what's important to us, upper middle class, overly educated uh, uh, whites who are in Chicago until we move to New York to move up the ladder. This is what we think should be talked about about blacks. How many black people are actually on WBEZ, on Channel 11? Look at Channel 11. I mean, how many black people, they used to have at least one black person, you know, in the lineup. They got none. So what's that about? But, but, but the bottom line, I think it's about money. Like everything else, it's about, okay, where do we get the money from? Black people are not giving us money. These people are giving us money. These corporations are giving us money. These are the people that we want. Carl, you, you. I asked my question. Oh, right in that case. Uh, Andy. You said you, you worked in advertising, and then, um, 
uh, it's you're a recovering ad man now. Right. You said. Right. Uh, does that mean that you, you came to become aware at some time that the media were promoting certain kinds of things that didn't reflect reality on the ground? No, no. I I got out of advertising mainly because I got too old to do it, and also because I started to uh, deal with the racism in the business. I was the first. Uh, act as race man was to start to confront racism in the advertising business. And the idea of, uh, uh, you know, the altruistic idea that I'm doing what I do uh, as uh, to yeah. kind of to counter what I did in advertising uh, is, is not so much. It is, I'm doing what I'm doing now and saying what I'm saying about media because I'm seeing that the average doesn't have a clue about what I did for a living uh, for years. And when I was doing it, I didn't see it as any problem. I mean, it was fun to do. And I made a lot of money. So I didn't have any problems with doing it. But I do have a problem with the American public being so ignorant of the fact that they don't have a clue about the media. <laughs> so I at least want to say to people like you and other people, hey, you are living in a so-called democratic republic, but the whole idea, and even Jefferson, who I have big problems with on a lot of things, but uh, the whole idea that you can't have a, a democratic republic with ignorant people. And yet, nobody even says to the public, hey, you're ignorant. You don't know what's going on. You don't have a clue. So my media advocacy and stuff is not encounter what I did in advertising as much as it is to say, hey, you can't have a democratic republic. You call yourself a democratic or a democracy, even worse. You call yourself a democracy, and you don't have a clue. And, and the media, or the people who own the media, own the country. And that ain't you. OK. I think we ought to go to rebuttals, Brom. About four minutes, Brown. Right. About four minutes, four I think. Minutes. Let's thank our speaker tonight. Yes. And let's get to the rebuttals. All right. Four minutes. If you can do that. Brother Thompson, your glasses sorry. are here, your pen, oh, your I, notes, I, 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 your glass. Sorry. Don't be sorry, just get them on your Such a nice one. so nice. Some of my best friends are white. <laughs> Many of my relatives are black. I grew up in ignorance on the south side in a completely white community, knowing nothing except the history of the white community in my neighborhood. And uh, it wasn't until much later I married an Af a black woman and found out that I could not live where I worked. I had to move into the south side of Chicago into certain communities where you know, it was all black. Uh, I integrated the neighborhood in a sense. But I learned much about African American history in that, in that short period of time. And uh, I'll never forget it. I don't know much about it. And Brother Thompson today has really illuminated uh, for us all, I think, uh, a good part of it. I look forward to his next book. to our rebuttals to be distracted with conversations. But anyway, uh, I came from the southern part of the world in Argentina in 1963. I didn't have the slightest idea what was going on 
in the United States. Uh, as time went by, I uh, began to realize that not only the people in Argentina were being exploited, tortured, jailed, beat up, and treated like animals, but uh, the same thing was going on in here. First, I, I, I just thought I have a very nice opportunity to make it here. I work like a, like I say, very hard, and uh, I was robbed. I was uh, fucked by the corporations, and every one of us is in the same position. The big buildings that they are in this country, the big beautiful buildings in my country. Uh, they were built with these hands, with hands like mine. And what did they got from building those big buildings? Nothing. Um, the bones of, of the people from the indigenous country, indigenous peoples in Argentina, Peru, Ecuador, whatever, those bones are in the basements of all those buildings. Uh, today, in Argentina, there are people who collect salt for a company. Uh, they are born in there, and they die there about 18 or 20 years old, because collecting the salt, they die you know, they, uh, breathing those things. Uh, they have no schools, no water, no electricity, and no future escaping that. If they try to escape, they are beat it up, grabbed by the police, and put in jail, or beat up, or killed. Uh, this is going on now. In South Africa, same thing. There are miners who are mining the platinum that we need for whatever purpose, industrial or, or luxury. And when they want to have a decent salary, they are mowed down by machine gun. And then, just to make it more uh, brutal than the people who are relative or they are other minors, they are charged with the murders. This is going on right now. It tells you, and I asked the speaker what he thought about coming out of this. I don't think that I could be optimistic that this will be resolved peacefully. I don't think that the people who have develop this system where money is the ultimate thing. The news media only respond to make money. The corporations only respond to make money. And on that process, they destroy the, everything. Humanity, human rights, the environment. There is nothing to stop the corporations from making money. Whether you have to poison the rivers, throw radioactivity in the lakes and in the air, Whatever it is that you have to do to make money, that's Thank fine. You. Thank you. This is where I am asking people, do you see a change? Do you see the time where society will not work like that? And that's what I want to see. Anybody have a vision? How do we get from here to there? Little changes on civil rights, on respecting some union to make a strike or something, that's not, this is, this is much deeper than that. This is real deep, what I'm asking. And, and as far as I can tell, I don't have the vision, I don't have the ability, I don't have the, uh, what it takes to, to, to imagine how do we get from here to there. And what, the only thing I see is violence. Because none of these people who are doing this are going to give up any of their privileges by talking. By us going and say, oh, we want to be peaceful and we are going to uh, go along with you if, you if you give up this way of doing things. It's not going to happen that way. So we have to start thinking, do we have any idea of how do we have to operate society without having to be so brutal and having only money as a guiding
Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think the speaker they said that the greatest something is, is uh, when you ever somebody imitates you, the greatest compliment. Well, the speaker imitated me because he was rolling. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he knows, he answered them questions just like I would ask them. And all the only time you could ask question, ask a question like he asked them, you know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> uh, people uh, have been said here just now, and just since we've been here. We don't own shit. We just people being used. All of us being used. Now I was born in Mississippi. And when I was little, when they put you, you go out there to play, you go out there to chop that cat, or pick that cat. But guess what? When I was picking cotton, I'm on this side of the grab road. White folk wasn't picking cotton with you. They was picking on that side of the road. The people, I'll ask this question rhetorical. Even though white folks was on this side, black folks was on this side, they might have got 10 cent more, 100 pounds of cotton than the black folk, they still was motherfucking cotton picker. Today, it's no different. The guy in charge don't give a fuck who you were. Back in those days, his priority was probably, most of his priority was between the Pacific and the Atlantic. Therefore, he could cater to this cotton picking, poor white person over here, needing the field superior to the black cotton picker over there. But he's in the war, what the word they use now? Oh, do, 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 do. In other words, it's worldwide now. The guy that run the United States run the world. The guy that run Brazil run the world. So it ain't no more he could give a fuck about what your color is now. Go over to Greece if you think he give a fuck about your color. He was in South Africa driving Rolls Royce and, and them folk in Greece got the head down in a, in a bread mouth. Man, and Frank asked a good question. How do we get our country back? Huh. We can't get our country back. Why? Like the speaker said, to you get your country back, you got to have some intelligence and you got to be able to recognize the problem. But if you got that housewife abuse housewife syndrome, and the question is always in the back of her mind, and if you can get her confident, she will tell her, well, where can I go? Uh, 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 what can I do? Well, believe it or not, and I hate to speak for the majority of the population in the United States. But that's the question that I theorize in the back of their mind. They've been brainwashed like we, that they're superior in all of that. And guess what? If they face the goddamn truth, Chicago, you, talk, you think that Detroit was leveled in the civil rights movement, and Watson, Los Angeles was burned down? The shit, if white folks ever wake up, man, this look like a goddamn prayer. And to show you, that I'm not making this up. Guess what? The housing market was a corporate a thuggery and put together by the people that run the financial empire and the big corporation to get money and power and to maintain that money and power. Now guess who you think the victim would be? If black folks make up 15%, and I might be stretching the number, 15% of the population, they the poorest of all those folks, ain't got nowhere in the money that 15% say other white folks. Who in the fuck do you think these crook ass cocksuckers is milking? Do you think they trying to milk Englewood to get rich? They, they, you think they ripping off the minorities, poor ass minorities to get rich? They getting where the money is. The money is in the 85%. And they don't give a fuck what color you are. How much evidence do you need? <laughs> they done showed you what they think about you by making somebody black than whoever is the president of the United States. <laughs> and if you think that he won't go over and kiss an African's ass to get his oil or his money and kick you in the ass to maintain his money, you got to be crazy. <laughs> In 1965, I came here and uh, Salt Lake City, I went to school, but downtown Saturday night, I asked somebody, where is the restroom? He said, go to Greyhound, a couple of blocks down. I went there and uh, from one building, lots of noise was coming. 
and uh, so I went to find out what's going on. And a bunch of black people were dancing there and loud music. That's the first time I knew in Salt Lake City there are black people because I didn't see them. In, uh, after graduating, uh, I came to Chicago in 1969 and I was looking for a job. So I had gone to way south side in uh, Indiana, coming back. I said, let me see what south side looks like. So I got up and ended up in a black community, all blacks. And so I, I didn't know anything, I was walking around. And uh, some, black, some black guy dressed in a suit in a car, he comes by me and stops there and says, hey. I say, what? He said, what are you doing here? I say, I just looking. And I was, I was wearing in a suit and there, and he said, no, no, get, get, get inside the car. I said, why? No, he said, get inside the car, then I'll tell you. So he said, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> you know, and he drops me at L station and said, look, and it's dangerous for you to wearing suit and everything walking around there. And uh, I think uh, that was 1969. So that's the first time I went south side. I don't know when you guys went there. Then I took a job at a U.S. Steel Gary, Indiana. And then I used to go to the library there. I lived downtown. And a black woman used to come there, so we, we were kind of friendly. One night, one day, she came with her husband. And uh, I said, he, she introduced me, and I said, do you know something? I've been, never been to black home. She said, honey, why don't you invite him for dinner? And they invited me for dinner. So how many of you have gone to a black house for dinner? See, I went in 1969 to Black Homework Dinner, you know. Since then, lots of things have changed. I used to have a 50% of my customers in my retail store, Chicago Mail, used to be black. And I used to go every year, a couple of times by bus, south side, to see what it looks like because my customers came from there. See, when I was in New York City, I had a business. I used to sell to black businessmen on the 125th Street. That time it was all black, and the Third Avenue in the Bronx. So I did not consider black in a different way, as, a, as a probably white people must have considered. And uh, I, I, I had a good relationship with them. And uh, I, I've been very critical, critical for black community so many times. In 1992, I wrote an article, Black America. And in that, I saw, I, I wrote, task before black community is to create a climate where majority community feel comfortable and culturally aligned with it. White people fear of black is real. The resentment is real. None of this helps. The real role model for black children are stable families with within black community and white community. It is same for white children. What is happening is that, that uh, even now, when you are watching the TV in, in a, my building in a common room, and uh, news comes out, and a south side they were shooting and. Okay. <laughs> then I, there is news comes out, people kill, say, look, these are black people, okay? And then how can, uh, I, you know, and how can we complain? <coughs> so then black leaders have lots of work to do. Barack Obama never went and told the black children, that, hey, you should go to school. You should be telling that. He never told to black people who sell drugs, kids who sell drugs and do other things, that, hey, don't do that. That looks bad, that is bad for you. Be like me. Apologetic uh, kind of uh, manifesto is, is very typical and just tells me that, yeah, racism is, is very, very alive, although it has different faces and different makeup. And um, two points to resonate on what was said here. One was uh, yours, Jean, about the uh, label. We keep changing and uh, coming from another country, in 1971, 
I noticed that that um, racism was alive and they were trying to overcome it by coming with a new label. So uh, it was not colored anymore, it was uh, then uh, uh, black and African American and, and Negro was a bad word and I didn't understand why. Um, it means the same as black and that was the what Africans um, refer to themselves as, as the race. But um, it, the, the whole issue is, uh, there is no, we think too much in binary simple terms and we like to divide people and divide them according to arbitrary categories. There is no white other than a dead man, okay? No one alive is white, and, and a black man could be only when after they, uh, you know, a fire, charred by fire. There is no such thing. There is also no pure race. It's a social construct. We are all a mix. And you're right. If a Frenchman will come, a black Frenchman will come here, they will still call him black or Afro-American, but not French. When they, uh, I came from Israel, and many times people say, "Oh, so, uh, so, are you Jewish or um, Arabic or Muslim?" And I said, "I'm an atheist." Oh, that, that, that same thing. You're Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jewish because socially, that's the way the world wants to see me, um, which is some kind of ethnicity. We, we attribute, we like to attribute ethnicity to, uh, to people um, in a way that's very divisive and uh, really has no, um, I don't see what would be the benefits and I'm very curious to see how creatively you are going to make it a positive. Uh, the only positive I see is just abolish all those categories. Uh, who needs? Uh, we, we, we can, we have enough variety on an individual level, refer to people as individuals and, and look at their uh, uniqueness. Um, and uh, that's why secular humanism makes more sense to me than anything. Um, now, the other uh, issue that I, that I was kind of ticked was about human rights, um, and uh, this gentleman asked about uh, LGBT people. Um, to me, you know, uh, human rights are the basic thing to humans. I would even include some other species. Uh, but um, the category that a person is, is, um, uh, belongs to is really irrelevant to the humanity. Uh, and those are categories. Um, and our problem, and Eugene said we, we need intelligent people that can see the problem, is exactly because we don't abstract beyond our special group. So Jews think about anti-Semitism, and black people think about the racism. And I'm not saying everybody, but, but not enough to, to go beyond uh, LGBT gender. You, you, you had a stereotype about the uh, uh, housewife, the woman, the housewife that is kind of victimized. Well, you have a gender stereotype. Um, I mean, to see beyond that, that we are all inflicted with all those useless, destructive category stereotypes takes, really takes an effort, but that's the only way that we will be able to get anywhere, anytime. Oh, thanks, Karen. Okay. Uh, 
We had a, a, a small discussion about uh, laziness. Uh, and some people were accused of being lazy. I think uh, most of us are guilty of laziness. Uh, but uh, Paul Lafargue, uh, who was uh, Marx, Karl Marx's uh, son-in-law, wrote a, a, a little book, uh, The Right to be Lazy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I discovered a little bit about laziness uh, when I found out uh, the, the land holding system in, in uh, Ireland. Uh, in Ireland, there were different classes of people and uh, different rent systems. In uh, Northern Ireland, uh, the, in Ulster, uh, the, uh, if you were a Protestant, uh, part of the uh, uh, Scots-Irish and uh, English uh, settlement in Northern Ireland. Uh, you uh, you could hold land at a different rate of uh, rent, and in Northern Ireland uh, than if you were Roman Catholic. Uh, but you also had the right, uh, whether you were Protestant or Roman Catholic, uh, to improve the land uh, and, and the, uh, you, you were able, uh, as long as you paid your rent, uh, you were able uh, to uh, make whatever uh, profit you could from the land. And uh, consequently, people in Ulster were harder workers than um, um, landholders in other parts of Ireland. Uh, because in other parts of Ireland, you the rents could be changed uh, if you're more profitable. Uh, you were paying a percentage of, of what uh, you, you made, uh, and they could raise your rents. So, the rest of Ireland, people were lazy. They didn't improve the land that much. They didn't improve their properties. Uh, as much, and uh, they were accused of being lazy uh, compared to the people in Ulster uh, who, because they could improve themselves, were, were seen as ambitious and forward looking. Okay. Uh, my own experience with my first, my, my, my father built up a, oh, well, that's another story. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> all right. Yes, exactly. My comments will be very brief. First, I'd like to thank our speaker for coming tonight. I learned some new things tonight. And, that's why I come here in the first place. Second, the comments were made about Barack Obama, how he does not speak to schools, and how he does not, how shall I say this, hold himself up as a role model. Well, I'm sorry, I think he speaks to young people all the time. And I think he speaks to schools all the time. And I think he does, I think he encourages people not to drop out, and then he encourages people not to do drugs or whatever. And that's my that's my statement. Thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Binkley, uh, I uh, um, 
I wasn't sure what I was going to get up to talk. Uh, I'm kind of uh, physically tired today. That's why I didn't ask a question. I was pondering, well, should I ask a question? Of a very large omission um, to the speaker's uh, talk, unless I missed it. Um, nothing about Harold of Washington, um, a very uh, important uh, um, aspect of uh, black history in Chicago. I, um, of course, uh, not everyone uh, remembers that uh, time period, but uh, of course in 1983, uh, um, politically things fell into place that uh, he happened to win the primary with something like 36 or 37 percent of the vote and the two white candidates, uh, Byrne and um, Daly, uh, uh, the son of, the, uh, of Richard J. Daly, um, won, uh, um, split the vote with Byrne. Uh, and that led to Washington um, winning the primary. Uh, there was a guy named Epton uh, who had the Republican nomination. The Republican almost never got anywhere close to being able to win the uh, general election, but on account of the racist uh, 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 electorate, um, many people that normally would vote Democratic without any question were unwilling to vote for Washington um, because he was, it simply was because he was black. There was an excuse made that he had not filed his tax returns uh, for some period of years, five years or something like that. I don't remember exactly the situation. In most of those years, he did not owe taxes, um, but there might have been a thing where maybe there might have been a thing where maybe one or two of the years he did, um, but that uh, the entire amount uh, he didn't. Uh, it was a very it was a complicated thing, but uh, because of the fact that um, uh, that the case had been adjudicated, uh, he had gone through the court system, and uh, um, it was a sort of a red herring that a lot of politicians uh, have these kind of things that. Uh, uh, that happened. Um, it was not as he was not. He didn't take bribes. He wasn't corrupt, um, and uh, so there was little real reason why um, um, white Democrats should not have voted for him in that primary, other than racism. So, I worked a precinct uh, on Washington's behalf in uh, 1983 uh, on that basis because uh, he was progressive, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I didn't do much to change um, um, the opinions, I'm sure, of the people in my ward, but at least I went to door to door and uh, gave them the spiel about uh, why they should vote for Washington. Uh, and he, of course, he managed to beat Upton, and then in 87, um, he squeaked by and he, uh, barely against, I think it was Hines was the uh, Republican candidate. I worked the precinct then, um, the same situation. Um, just by giving my credibility as a progressive uh, tonight, um, I also worked with a uh, uh, organization uh, that went into the public schools uh, to try to educate uh, students, not simply in black areas, but uh, one of the main uh, schools we went to uh, uh, was uh, A.O. Sexton School, which is uh, southwest of uh, Hyde Park in a uh, particularly uh, um, lower class or underprivileged uh, black area. Um, and uh, I have to admit that, that it was very discouraging uh, because of the uh, disciplinary uh, Problems. But there still were some students there that I was able to have an effect with, uh, with uh, you know, trying to teach the kids uh, um, to perform um, um, uh, simplified Shakespeare uh, plays and uh, plays uh, about black history. Uh, we did a play about uh, George Washington Carver, a short play uh, uh, at one point. I also had them uh, do a play that I had written um, where they uh, enacted that they were uh, like protons uh, and uh, electrons in an atom, that kind of thing, um, uh, teaching them science uh, and uh, about evolution, rocks and dinosaurs, stuff like that. Um, so um, I just wanted to make those comments. They don't really mean much of anything. Uh, usually I don't talk too much about myself, but um, I was uh, sort of inspired to want to say something about what Frank um, Aguilar talked about, um, uh, his despair that he's feeling tonight. <laughs> I sort of feel the same kind of despair, uh, uh, especially having uh, seen that horrible um, uh, show in uh, Tampa. You're all probably aware of what I'm talking about. And uh, the scary situation that we will be um, in, in in case those uh, horrible uh, criminals, <laughs> corporate criminals and liars, um, are able to take control of the government um, again um, uh, come January, assuming we survive the Mayan calendar turnover. Um, this is something I've been pondering for a long time, of what, what is our way out? Uh, obviously, 
Uh, we are in a terrible situation um, because of the corporate control, but uh, I have thought that um, um, Occupy Wall Street, uh, very clever and um, smart and accomplished people, I've heard some of them interviewed, not by the main media, but by the media on MSNBC, uh, that they are part of the way forward. Uh, also part of the way forward is uh, alternative uh, economic um, uh, just like people uh, are involved with alternative medicine uh, to try to get around the corporate medical um, uh, establishment um, by um, doing things that are on the, not, not just listening to their doctors only, but um, we need alternate uh, economic solutions, especially boycotts, for example, I never uh, go to a BP station, you know, things like that. I have a long list of things that I'm boycotting. Of course, it would be a terribly long list if it was everybody, but uh, I try to make sure um, that um, um, that I at least boycott the, the worst of the corporations, um, but um, it 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 is a big effort. Um, a lot of people would have to be involved um, in a, sh a shadowy economy, is what we're talking about. Um, where we uh, am I out of time? But a, a shadow economic um, alternate um, system is what we really try to have to try to develop, where we cut out the really worst of the corporate criminals and begin to. Um, get more of a corporate responsibility in our country. Uh, I kind of thought this presentation was uh, a, kind of a trivia exposition. Not that it was toy department, it did bring up some important topics, but if you don't understand urban renewal and some of the twists and turns of urban renewal, you don't really understand the mechanics of race. Now, who's really running this city? Uh, talk about Harold Washington being an anti-racist. Uh, he tried to put in, tried to, he did level one black neighborhood and tried to level another for stadiums. And there's this big, beautiful, abandoned railroad yard at Roosevelt and the River that's the best place in town for a stadium. The reason they don't use that for a stadium is because they've got that plan for urban renewal. They want to get their folks in around the downtown and build a buffer. They come right out and say it. It wasn't in their old books. I mean, just a blatant. And it goes in one year and not the other around this town. But I think until we get in touch with that sort of thing, uh, that this is just uh, kind, of, kind of be an exercise of chasing tails. And incidentally, that housing development was supported by the Chicago Federation of Labor, too. But that's another that's another topic in itself. But anyway, you talk a lot about your uh, Bronzeville. You didn't say anything too much about what happened just north of Bronzeville in the early fifties. They wiped out. They displaced thousands of blacks for IIT and Michael Reese Hospital in the Prairie Shores and Lake Meadows housing projects. There's a book about this, uh, Making the Second Ghetto, by Arnold Hirsch. He comes right out and says that it's because they were afraid of, the, of the downtown was afraid of blacks. And you get a little deeper into that, there's a lot of Hyde Park uh, input into this phony anti-racism too, including the uh, Martin Luther King marches. They even co-opted co Martin Luther King for this stuff. The reason they want open housing is not so that black to move if they want to, it's so they can be moved. They were having problems moving all the blacks out of these areas with all this displacement. So they create these open housing laws so the blacks can be moved into other areas. 
And the proof of that pudding is a book by Anthony Downs. Uh, Anthony Downs uh, about uh, uh, integrating the suburbs. You can't use the move blocks out of the city. And you can remember this statistic out of, out of the recent uh, statistic out of, out of the recent census. The city's lost some hundred thousand people since the uh, policy since before that. But you, uh, you, you know, it's, it's they're all very deliberate. First off, I would like to uh, thank our speaker again tonight for some very perceptive and very good answers to a lot of questions. I'll be very brief. I personally am not a racist, nor do I intend to be one. But I think a lot of the reason why race is brought up today is our gentleman was an advertising man, and I think the term they use is called market segmentation versus racism. That's all I'm going to say. I'd like to thank our speaker again tonight for an intelligent and well done presentation. <laughs> My name is Andy Anderson, and uh, I'd like to thank the speaker also for um, a good questions and answer session where he answered the questions straightforward. Uh, any virtually any question people asked, he did the best to answer them. So, and so far, I haven't seen. He gave us, uh, you know, a, an address of a, a monument there down on uh, well, the Eighth Armory or something. Yeah. Uh, nobody has come up here and said, that's a bunch of bullshit, that's not there. <laughs> when I give a talk and list historic names, dates, and places, people will come up here in the rebuttal and say, well, that didn't happen, that's not there. Uh, so I, I want to know what the difference is, if anybody can tell me that later, because uh, I've been giving uh, reality-based talks here for the last five years. And uh, tonight I'd like to add something. I brought some book reports and some things that I think can specifically help the African American community, uh, especially if you know anybody that knows anybody that has kids, kids or grandkids, try to get a few copies of this book written by the African American doctor, Nancy Turner Banks. It's called AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire. The book is about a lot of the history of corporate activity in America, it's not just about opium or AIDS or diamonds, it's a, uh, an education in what's happened in America in the last 150 years and how we're seeing today big money in motion, uh, especially from the pharmaceutical industry. And page 374 and 375, I'll give you the brief update, just read it to you. So blacks were always five times as likely to have a positive HIV test as whites. That's 500% more likely than Caucasians to get a positive result because the HIV test is rigged in such a way to make it appear that blacks are more HIV positive. The chemicals they use to make the test, the HIV test, are front-loaded so that they will react five times more likely to African-American blood than Caucasian blood. That's on page 374, 375. Um, what I do, my brother and I run what's called the Northwest Information Service. We take books like this and condense it or translate the paper mass, the essence of it, into a one-page book report, cliff notes, whatever you want to call it. You don't have to wait through a 40-page Sparks or Cliff Notes of one book. The essence of it is summarized on a single page like this because we realized a long time ago nobody has time to actually physically read 10, 15, 20 books a week on a subject to try to get uh, educated on it. The, um, right now, the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical industry is running a scam directed at pregnant women, especially African-American pregnant women, because they've known for 25 years 
the pregnant women carrying a healthy baby, many of them will test HIV positive because they're pregnant. The HIV tests come with an insert in the package that says, the lawyers put it in there, beware, this test doesn't test for the HIV virus. It reacts to almost anything else when you're sick. So they're giving away 200,000 free, it's five minutes already? Wow. Four minutes. So, oh, sorry, uh, and I'll finish real quick. It's 200,000 free tests a year to stamp medical records positive, HIV positive with that bogus test so that they, one, they don't have to provide affordable health insurance and they're developing a market for the HIV drugs, the anti-HIV drugs, which do give you the symptoms of AIDS. It's all spelled out in this book by Nancy Turner Banks and also this latest book, 2012 Official Stories by Liam Sheff. I have some, uh, I said, 20 page copies of chapter six in here is a 25-page summary of the entire AIDS epidemic. You don't have to read 100 books, you know, thousands of reports off the internet. He summarized it in one single chapter like nothing I've ever seen before. So anybody wants one, uh, come see me. Thank you. My name is David Hepler. I'm from the south side of Chicago. I grew up in Beverly for 42 years of my existing 44, you know, your present life. I want to thank our speaker so much for this wonderful presentation he did. I've heard him talk, you know, in detail about the history of Chicago, Robert Taylor Holmes, um, migration of, I, I will say, you know, the darker skin segment of our American population to the south suburbs, Riverdale, Calum, Calumet City, Dalton, uh, Sock Village, South Chicago Heights, all that, and uh, what Englewood, you know, has turned into. I even worked, get this, three years ago at Norfolk Southern Conrail's piggyback yard at 63rd and State, Indiana. Um, so I know what that area is like. Um, I want, quickly want to say to everybody here, I grew up during the wonderful, I will call them, Soul Train 70s which were unlike anything else America has experienced. I'm really trying to wonder in the last few years or so why Don Cornelius, uh, Norman Whitfield, and uh, Barry Gordy did not set up camp here in Chicago, this great city of ours, and try and make some kind of a cultural entertainment, you know, um, really kind of center, you know, beacon of light for the rest of the of America and the world that people could look up to as an artistic, you know, educational kind of center of the universe. I know they moved out to California where it's almost sunshine uh, 323 <coughs> days out of the year no matter what. But Chicago is a great city. Maybe we can engineer two square miles all the time to be snow free in the winter <laughs> no matter what. But I think that, I really think that if a newer generation of people who are the equivalent of, uh, you know, wonderful Don Cornelius, God rest his soul, and Barry Gordy, Norm Whitfield, new people, maybe even even uh, George Clinton from Parliament or uh, Samuel L. Jackson who starred in some sort of okay Star Wars films, if they would be an inspiration to Chicago people and try and persuade uh, communities of every ethnic, color, race, and creed right now to become interested in aerospace and science and engineering and create some sort of new manufacturing infrastructure here. We even have Boeing as a headquarters company here. This would be a great benefit that people could really get into. I don't want to get into the argument of gangster rap versus the good old R&B soul music of Johnny Guitar Watson or the Brothers Johnson or George Clinton's extraterrestrial parliament stuff, mothership, that was just great. And maybe stuff, something like that in the next few years might get reinvented in a new way. And I hope that Chicago here and uh, outlying suburbs even in Indiana and lower Michigan would embrace us as a new beacon of uh, paranormal, you know, thinking for the rest of the world. And America might make a new image, in, you know, for uh, the next hundred years or so to make a great new start. Thank you. Elwood Blues. 
all, I came to Chicago the same time you did, 1947. I moved in to 5631 South Cottage Grove Avenue, right across from what is now the DeSalvo Museum of African American History. It was the police station of the Park Police, which wasn't merged with the city police until 1959. Uh, Lee, I arrived from Boston, Massachusetts, and my mother was from a family of uh, what were, uh, they were anti-slave fleet way back in the 19th century. And they were still mad about the Civil War. They hadn't gotten over that yet. So we, Hyde Park, there, was still, there were blacks just beginning to move into Hyde Park at the time. No one really knows if it, was ever, if it would have ever really been integrated like it is now because the University of Chicago has so much to do with it. The Hyde Park Kenwood Renewal program ripped down a whole lot of Hyde Park. Uh, the comedy team of uh, Mike Nichols and Elaine May referred to that as black and white united against the poor, which it was. Uh, what shocked my mother, who came from a family of abolitionists, uh, a guy, one of the neighbors, my mother didn't tell me this for years later, he told her, like I said, blacks was moving, were moving in a Hyde Park. If we ever caught a nigga east of Cottage Grove Avenue, we'd kill him a few years ago. And like I said, my mother was shocked. And uh, of course not everyone was like that. The conductor, streetcar conductor who lived downstairs from me, an old Irishman, worked, you remember the car band at 38th and Cottage Grove? Uh, he worked out of there. And I remember uh, one of the neighbors saying, gee, they're getting a lot of blacks on the cars these days. And he says, yeah, and they're all good men. They've been kicked around long enough. It's about time someone gave them a break. So everyone wasn't racist back in those days. And, but there sure were a hell of a lot of them who were. And uh, oh, your Chicago Tribune? I remember in the 1960s when they were describing people as Negroes. John Smith, the truck driver, common Negro. <laughs> that went on. Uh, that's a great paper. I call it the turd yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then years ago, if you went downtown in the late 40s and the 50s, didn't see any blacks working on the stores of the banks. And I found out when the great civil rights movement was going in the 60s when I was in the army, the racism wasn't dead because I met those southern boys in the army, and boy, they were something else. They'd be nice to your face. But one of them actually called me a nigger lover one time. I was a CCA motorman that used to hang around with a black transit worker from New York. So that's how I got that name. So. The South will rise again. Well, I'm glad it really, well, I guess maybe it did, but <laughs> in the way they wanted to. Uh, I used to go down, I don't know if you remember this place, it was a haberdashery hobby store called uh, House of Trains in Cottage Grove. <clears throat> it was right next to the car barn. I used to go down there to get magazines and books. And then, of course, there was a huge car barn. I'd walk around and back. People say, you walked the Idaho, the Idaho Wells projects are there. Yeah, they were, but they were low rise. In fact, I lived in a project in Boston when I was a kid. The high rises, that was an altogether different story. They really ruined this project on the, uh, of course, they didn't have all the dope around them, too, and all the shootings. Uh, what else have I got here? I can't read my own writing. That's pretty damn bad. Oh, speaking of names, Bronzeville. I worked on the L for uh, well, 37 years. A lot of blacks I know, my best friends, some of them. Uh, a lot of them don't like the name Bronze, Bronzeville. You ever hear that? Quite a few guys I know. Of course, that's a better name than the black belt. <laughs> so, okay. what they used to call it. You're out of time. Yeah, so I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Last three putter. Last three putter. I'm Margaret Oliver, and um, everybody else has been introducing themselves too. So thank you very much. I've learned lots of 
obscure facts. <laughs> and um, I, I think there are other histories written about um, about Black Chicago, um, but I I can't tell you names. And I should look them up and email you or something. But you probably know all of that. It's in my bibliography. Oh, there you go. See. Um, at any rate, um, but it was interesting, and I think that, that uh, Jean's point about that you answered the questions is very important because you were very straight about what you answered, and that was excellent. Um, I just wanted to make a point, the same point that Ayala did, and it's so much a part of our culture that we don't know it, and that is that race is, is not a, a genetic or a uh, biological uh, fact. It is not. No biologist can say race, what race anybody is. And, and any biologist will tell you that, that, that races are impossible to define. Specifically for the reason that Ayala uh, brought up is that there's a mix. And if you go back far enough, we are all from Africa. We came out of Africa um, a hundred, is it, about 70,000 years ago. Um, from um, Homo sapiens that uh, evolved there and spread into Asia and from Asia over into the Americas, of, um, probably about 20,000 or 50, 20 to 15,000 years ago, up into Europe about 50,000 years ago, um, over into Asia. That Asia was probably the first place that Homo sapiens spread from. Um, Africa, which is kind of a newer finding. And so if you go back far enough genetically, we're all African. And then when we all split off, then what happened is and then we all got back together again. So I met this idiot from Greece who said the Greeks were pure, and I thought, are you kidding? That's the crossroads of the world. <laughs> Everybody had some action in Greece. <laughs> so, um, it, you know, so that you just, and um, if you look at Native Americans here, they came over in, in waves in different times from um, northeastern Asia and uh, over the uh, bridge, the land bridge um, in the Bering Strait that was above the waterline at that point because of ice ages and things. So they came across, and, and they came across in one wave and another wave, and they originally traced this by language groups, and now they can trace it by heredity. But when Europeans invaded the New World, you know, now it's very difficult. First of all, they brought diseases that eliminated about 90% of the indigenous people, literally. It was decimated. They were reduced to one-tenth of their population. But the rest, you rarely find anyone who's definitely totally Navajo, don't, doesn't have anybody else in their family who's not Navajo. You don't find that. You find people who are uh, Lakota Sioux that are, are mixed with, um, I don't know, Winnebago or whatever, so that you have people who are um, mixed. So it doesn't matter where you are. Everybody's all mixed up. So. Um, Okay, time's up. So race is a product of our culture and social division by people who want to control us. And I would like people to remember that. Hi, I want to start out by saying I'm colored. <laughs> that I'm still colored. I, the rest of it's too confusing for me. But I do appreciate what the lady before me was saying, and that was the bottom line for everything. Everybody is all mixed up. There's no pure anything anymore. And I think that that is where I agree with Jean when they say, don't call me African American because I don't even know which way to point to Africa. Um, I'm an American. And as far as America is concerned, the people of color in America are to me the most, is it ingenuous, other than the Indian, the American Indian. Because we were created right here by everybody who came over and 
did the number. And then here we came. As far as black Americans are concerned, I, I've always thought of us as the, um, you know those kids that your husband has outside of the family that you don't want nobody to know about? Yeah, the illegitimate. children. <laughs> That's who we've always been. You know, we're over there, keep them over there and don't play with them and don't talk to them uh, because he talks and walks and looks like me. So uh, that's who we've always been. And until we get to a point that I think that he was so sincere in what your husband was asking about how is it all going to end, it's going to end when we all stop. When we all stop with the titles, with the definitions, and uh, who you are, what you look like. Years ago, my kids were in um, karate school. And they used to do this little doohickey every time they went in. And I couldn't know, what are you doing that for? And Sid say, would say, well, this is out of respect for me. I'm like, well, is he God? You know, what, what are they bowing for? Afterwards, when I got older, I went to a Kriya, no, uh, Kriya Yoga Temple. And they did the same thing. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute now. <laughs> is it karate or is it Kriya? What's going on here? So the guy explained to me, he says, when you bow, when you come into a room, you bow to the God and the people. Because everybody has God in them, whatever that God is, whoever they believe in. Your God, my God, it's just God. Not to the white person or the black person or the male or the female, the short person, the tall person, the good looking person or whatever. You bow to the God of that person and I want my God to interact with your God, period. Nothing more, nothing less. Because when I go beyond that, it gets very confusing. Then, in thinking about this whole thing about race, it, it just amazed me. Uh, Clint Eastwood, I think it was, married this young woman some years ago, and they said that her, they gave her background for her grandparents, Indian, white, Cuban, and da 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 da. And they called her a person of color. And I said, well, I'll be damned. That's the same background as my people, but I'm called a Negro, or black, or, or, you know, or whatever. But without the money, I couldn't be a person of color. <laughs> so now I look at the commercials, and they have a commercial now, I think it's fantastic, for makeup. And they got Beyonce and Myra Carey talking about, well, my mother was this and my father was that. And when you put the makeup on, it just conforms to who I am. And I thought to myself, oh, shit, now they got makeup that goes into your historical background and pulls up all your pigments. And it, but what they call them is beautiful. They don't call them black, they don't call them Negroes, they don't call them African Americans. And by the way, when you were being born on, in, on Giles, was it, 36, my family had moved from there. We lived in Woodlawn, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, we were in Woodlawn way back then, 1945. So, uh, and we're in High Park now. So anyway, thank you all. I, I'm glad to see that so many people came, although I told my friend when we drove up, I said, mm, we got somewhere to park tonight. We don't have to fight for a seat. <laughs> but to see those that are here, that you're here, it's wonderful for the support, and at least some of the word gets out, because each of us carries something with us. I hear that. Speaker gets the last I word. I on, and when you begin, and you do the speaking. <laughs> Speaker gets the last word. You get the last word. Well, I'm assuming that everybody's spoken. Yes, but you get the last word. You can comment on the rebuttals or any piece, any words or official well, parkings well, I, of I wisdom. I have to say that I am uh, very impressed by the turnout. And the, this is one of the few... Uh, occasions where I've seen this mixture of people uh, being able to sit and listen and talk and discuss and uh, agree and disagree and be enlightening. I'm learning. I, mean, I learned a whole bunch. I don't know about you, but I learned a bunch. And that's what it's about. Uh, one of my uh, hopes, my optimism, is, is and my uh, goal with creativity is to engender more of this kind of talks uh, and make it popular. One of my goals is to make uh, thinking 
popular <laughs> in America. I know, don't laugh. I know you're laughing at me. You're laughing. Good luck. Good luck. Win the lottery first. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's one of. I told you I'm an optimist, and I, I, I this. I don't know about you, but it, it encourages me that people like you exist and are willing to think and talk uh, and to uh, and to prove that people are capable of thinking and talking and disagreeing and not being disagreeable. And uh, I'm glad I came. Thank you. Give us a plug for your website, your book. Thank you, Mr. Thompson, and thank you. Well, well, hope to see you. Thank you.